vultures uh, in general are often thought to be dirty or disgusting birds, and that can't be farther from the truth. Sometimes it's going to be the smallest things that have, that have the biggest impact. What is necessary is just being able to understand how our lives are better for them being out there and have a little bit of appreciation for, you know, for what they do for us. The parts of the tree snails are sort of a cautionary tale about when attempted biological control goes wrong. Hello and welcome to the Woodland Park Zoo. I'm your host, Shelby Miller. We have a special day planned for you today. It's all about building empathy for overlooked and maybe underappreciated animals, both here at the zoo and some you'll even have in your own backyard. Coming up, we'll fly high with the vultures to better understand the role they play as nature's recyclers. Plus, we'll travel to a bug's world where a tiny lab exists. The work going on inside is literally saving a species from extinction, even if it's at a snail's pace. But first, I'm not going to lie, spiders, they haven't always been my favorite, and I bet quite a few of you can relate to that. So today we're going to put those common misconceptions to bed, get up close and personal with these creepy crawlies, and learn the critical roles they play. Eight long, hairy legs and eight small, beady eyes. I bet spiders don't come to mind when you think about animals at the zoo. In fact, I know a lot of people don't like to think about spiders much at all. When people think of tarantulas, they think, unfortunately, of big, scary spiders that chase you and bite you and you'll die, and none of that is true. Zookeeper Sue Anderson knows a thing or two about spiders. She realizes plenty of people are scared of them, but she says there's no reason to be. She introduced us to the zoo's own Chilean rose tarantula. One fascinating fact is that these tarantulas can live for more than 20 years. And this species is one that you usually see in zoos, nature centers, um, science centers as a handling tarantula because they are so docile. And that's really good because it helps to get a lot of people over their fear of spiders because you can see she doesn't fit the bill at all for something that's horrible and runny and wants to jump on my face and suck at my eyeballs or something <laughs> silly like that. And that's the kind of thing people say. Which sounds crazy because it is. Spiders aren't supposed to be cute and cuddly, but they do play an important role in our ecosystem and they deserve some respect. If it wasn't for spiders, there'd be a lot less food for us and for all of our animals. If there wasn't as many spiders, there'd be a lot more diseases, malaria, uh, sleeping sickness in Africa because spiders are probably the, one of the biggest, if not the biggest pest control that we have, especially here in the Pacific Northwest. Flies, mosquitoes, and other pesky insects are a perfect spider snack. In the fall in Washington, it's hard to go for a walk without seeing a few of these fellas, or at least running into a few of their webs. The cross orb weaving spider has a beautiful white cross of dots down its back and it makes a beautiful orb web and that make that web new every morning and then every night they eat it and they're the best recyclers in the world because that web is made of protein. So they're basically able to eat their house every day and then make a new one every morning, which is pretty doggone cool. Another creature that keeps bugs at bay is the bat. There's about 10 species in the Seattle area. Because they're the only wild mammal in Washington that can carry rabies, some people are afraid of them. But it's rare people come into contact with bats. They're pretty small. I mean, most of them, um, even like a couple inches, they can um, kind of tuck themselves in the little spaces. So a lot of times you would never even see them. But if you look kind of up into an open um, part of sky at night, especially over a lake or a pond, um, you could see them flying, they may, you know, maybe as big as a robin with their wings, you know, open. Because they're nocturnal, a lot is still unknown. So this year, Woodland Park Zoo began monitoring them by recording bat calls to analyze what species live nearby. When we think of bats and roosting, I think we think of caves, you know, like packed with bats. And the truth is here in the Northwest, we're not really sure where our bats might um, hibernate. Um, or roost even overnight. Um, and so there's a lot of research still to be done about 
exactly how our bats live. And here's an animal we know more about, the snake. We only have a few snake species in western Washington, like rubber boas and gardener snakes. This is Obi, the ball python who's native to Africa. So a lot of people think that snakes are slimy or they think they're evil or mean. There's a lot of uh, mixed signals that get out there about snakes and so there's um, a lot of misconceptions about them too. And as you can see, Obi is really just enjoying the sunshine today and exploring this tree here and kind of just doing what snakes do. And he's not slimy at all. Not slimy at all. Feels cool. And you yep. described him like a like, kind of like a basketball feel, and that's just about right, even a little softer. Yep. And those scales play an important role. They help him to grip onto the tree as he's moving around. So each time he slides forward, the scale also slides a little bit and helps him get traction as he's moving and climbing around that tree. Obi isn't a venomous snake. He's a constrictor snake. You may see snakes sunbathing when you're out hiking. That's because they're cold-blooded animals and need to soak up the heat and UV light to digest their food and move around. And yes, snakes can bite, but they don't like to. But it is energetically expensive for them to bite us. They try to give as many warning signs as possible. So it's good that a rattlesnake has a rattle because that's its way of letting us know that it's in the area. Seeing snakes like Obi up close helps people overcome their fears. It does bridge that gap for people to get closer to them and see how unique and neat snakes are. Just the fact that they're so muscular, they don't have legs, but yet they can move around and climb and do amazing things with their body. Another animal that often gets an unfair bad rap is the vulture. Yes, we often see those bald-headed birds eating carcasses on the side of the road, but as we learn more, we quickly discover how truly amazing they are. Oh, he's a happy boy. He's a happy boy. The most favorite time of the year is the summer when we get that bright hot sunshine and he always puts his back to it and sticks out their wings. Um, and turkey vultures do that for a number of reasons. It helps them to heat up those feathers so if they have any sort of bugs or mites or things living in their feathers it helps to keep them clean. These guys are really extraordinarily clean birds so having weatherproofing on their feathers is really really important for them. When you say they're clean birds, I bet that would surprise a lot of people considering they often see them eating things that are maybe not quite so clean. Absolutely. So vultures uh, in general are often thought to be dirty or disgusting birds and that can't be farther from the truth. These guys are extremely sweet birds. They are also very, very smart. They only eat dead animals or carrion and so they help to remove animals that have died from really bad diseases like botulism or anthrax and when it processes through the turkey vulture all of those viruses and bacteria are gone. So when you see them maybe at the carcass of roadkill or something they're just doing a good job. They're doing they're the recycler they're a composter uh, in the animal world so it's a really really important job and their body is really designed to help them be really successful composters. They actually have an incredible sense of smell, so most birds don't have a sense of smell. And other vulture species will follow turkey vultures, so they can smell a carcass over a mile away when they're up in the wind thermals. Um, so they don't want to fly around too much because it wastes a lot of energy. So they have a really broad wingspan, almost as uh, broad as an eagle's, and they can get up in the wind thermals and just soar around using their nose, trying to find that next carcass to feed on. The snow leopard is one of the most mysterious big cats in the wild, and unfortunately the future of their habitat remains a mystery as well. For nearly 40 years, the zoos protected these beautiful big cats by supporting snow leopard trust, saving the endangered species and improving the lives of people who live near them. Blending in with the rocks alongside them, snow leopards are the masters of disguise. Their thick spotted gray white fur provides a perfect camouflage in the wild, earning these beautiful big cats the nickname Ghost of the Mountain. They interact well with humans. Um, and just they have such a robust personality and and they're very resilient animals and it's just you know makes me uh, 
feel sometimes like, what am I whining about? <laughs> I don't have it too, too bad. So yeah. I think they're, they're just, and every personality is different. Mm -hmm. So it's just, they're phenomenal animals. In the wild, these majestic animals live in the rugged mountains of Central Asia, where they've adapted to the cold, barren landscape and harsh weather. Their fur is very thick, very lush, very dense. It acts to help keep water off and protect them from temperatures. Another amazing feature is their tail. So their tail is really long. It's about, it's longer than the, the length of the body. They use that to wrap themselves up in want to help with uh, protecting them from warmth, uh, snowstorms, etc. They also use it for balance. And if you watch videos of, of snow leopards in the wild, their terrain, especially when they're chasing prey, that tail is just going every which way. That's not gravity or anything like that. That's them controlling that tail to help them with balance so that they can maneuver uh, throughout that, that terrain. These elusive cats also have big furry feet, which helps them run across the snow and hurdle down the mountainside. They can jump down 30 feet and walk away. I mean, if I jump 30 feet, I'm not walking away, even if, I, even if it was intentional. <laughs> yeah, their adaptations to survive and do well in, in the terrain that they live in is just phenomenal. But the snow leopard is under threat. Their amazing qualities sadly made them the target of poachers who hunt snow leopards for their lush coats. Villagers also kill these big cats to keep them from eating their livestock. Researchers believe there's only about four to 6,000 snow leopards left. Which is why in 1981, Helen Freeman, a Woodland Park Zoo employee, started Snow Leopard Trust, taking action to protect the endangered big cat. They've also done some very successful programs where they've made contracts with villages. If they don't have poaching for an entire calendar year, the entire village gets a, a reward. They've been very successful with that program. They've also been very successful with um, kind of reforming poachers and giving them a different lifestyle. Because a lot of the poachers, they, they don't necessarily enjoy going out and poaching snow leopards. They do it because they feel like they have to. They do it because they feel they have to protect something or that's how they make their money. But the Snow Leopard Trust has provided them poachers with a different way of life. And some of the poachers actually work for the Snow Leopard Trust now. Having these eye-catching cats at Woodland Park Zoo helps save snow leopards out in the wild. Guests love them and you know they, they make a, a great ambassador to their wild counterparts because um, it does draw. You, you see that walking by, you know, whether you're five or 85 or whatever, you're, you're, you're going to be, you know, intrigued by it. Once we see somebody who's very connected to that, <laughs> it gives us a really good opening to talk to them and to educate them and inspire guests to the Snow Leopard story and how they can help. Coming up on your inside look at the Woodland Park Zoo. Where else can you see an animal that's completely extinct in the wild? They're so cool. We go to a bug's world, putting the fate of the Tahitian tree snail under a microscope. Just right in this little room right here is probably about 5% or so of the remaining population of these tree snails in the world. Today we're taking you closer than ever before. From the newborn babies to the zoo's biggest cats and everything in between. Get ready for a wildlife experience like no other. So today's exam was an ultrasound examination. So sit down and get comfortable as we look inside the Woodland Park Zoo. Walking around the zoo, you may have noticed this tiny lab tucked beneath the trees. This is home to the Tahitian Partula snail, and this tree snail is actually extinct in the wild. So we went inside the lab to see how they're working to save this crucial critter. So these are our Polynesian tree snails, Partula nidosa, 
And these guys are one of the few animals that we have here at the zoo that are extinct in the wild. We partner with a couple different zoos, both nationally and internationally, to get these guys reintroduced into the wild in Tahiti. The Parchula tree snails are sort of a cautionary tale about when attempted biological control goes wrong. Sometimes there will be collateral damage, and these guys are uh, a, so a story of that. So what ended up happening was in the 1960s, uh, the giant African land snails were intentionally introduced to Tahiti to, as a food source for the people that were living there. But what they didn't really realize was that the giant African land snails, which are huge, there's sort of a model of one right here, they're really, really big. Um, but they're basically like large slimy garbage disposals. And so they just, they're like, they just devoured all of the crops that grew on the island. Um, so they were just decimating all of the food sources for all the people that were living there on the island. And so they said, oh, well now we need to get rid of these invasive African tree snails. And so what are we gonna do? So what they decided to do was introduce the rosy wolf snail. The rosy wolf snails are snails that eat other snails. And so they decided to try and introduce the rosy wolf snails to eat the giant African land snails. Um, but what ended up happening was that instead of eating the giant African land snails that are huge and aggressive and really fast, um, what they decided to do was eat the parchula tree snails because they're like little tiny, little fun-sized creme brulees. Um, and within about 15 years um, that they had almost, they had completely wiped out 51 of the uh, 76 different species of parchula snail on the island, um, including the parchula nidosa, which is the species that we have here. So without those, they noticed a change in what was going on around them? Yeah, there was a change in the ecosystem. So the trees weren't as healthy, and because the trees weren't as healthy, then there wasn't as much of a habitat for the native uh, plants and animals that were living there, or the native animals that were living in those plants. So it all just, it all ends up being a domino effect, so. so Something so small plays such a critical part in the ecosystem there. Let's talk more about that. Yeah, you know, sometimes it's gonna be the smallest things that have, that have the biggest impact. Um, so these tree snails eat all of the algae that grows naturally um, on the Tahitian islands. Um, they grow on a lot of the different uh, plant matter that are there, so on banana plants, on um, plantains, on all those different kinds of, um, of trees. And in order to keep those, uh, the circulation of those plants and, and those leaves uh, staying you know, nice and healthy, uh, these tree snails go in there and they eat all of that algae and it keeps the plants nice and healthy. And so without these partula tree snails, it can also affect the plants that are in the forest and it all just kind of goes downhill from there. So we have about 1,500 in here. So we do censuses on them about every two months. And so right now we have probably between 15 and 1,600 in there. So we've actually been super successful in breeding here. We don't really know if it's the climate of Seattle or what it is here, um, but we're very prolific in our breeding of these guys. We're really good at it somehow. How cool is it to work with a species that is extinct, knowing that you're doing something that's going to only help the ecosystem there? Oh, I love working with these guys. They're fantastic. They're such, they're such little things, but they pack so much of a story and such an important conservation story. And I mean, who else gets to work with extinct species? I mean, it's just, it's a really cool opportunity to be able to um, not only work with an extinct species, but be an important part of getting them back into the wild. Do you think that with the work that you guys are doing here and other zoos that they can no longer be extinct there? I'm confident. I'm confident that they'll, they'll, they're not gonna be extinct in the wild in my lifetime. I think they'll bounce back. <laughs>
Keeper Stephanie Miller loves working with the waterfowl at Woodland Park Zoo. In fact, she says some of the most critically endangered animals at the park are right inside the marsh. Our scaly-sided mergansers, the red-breasted geese, the falcated ducks that you see here, they're all very endangered. I would say the scaly sided are one of our most critically endangered birds in the marsh. That's because their habitats are disappearing. Ducks rely on wetlands and marshes to live and raise their babies. The habitats that waterfowl thrive in are areas that we tend to drain for our farmlands, for our crops. We think of it as draining land to make it useful, but we know now, we have learned, that wetlands actually protect us so much. They filter out toxins from our environment. They give resiliency to areas like Louisiana and Mississippi with hurricanes, right? We need our wetlands and our marshes for that. They have some of the most amazing biodiversity outside of things like rainforests, right? So they're super productive and they are the nurseries for our food. Most all, all of our seafood starts in a wetland or a marshland of some type. These diverse birds are also an indicator of our water quality, which means if our ducks and geese aren't doing well, our water probably isn't doing well either. We always make a joke that waterfowl foul the water, but that's a zookeeper joke because we're cleaning their pools. <laughs> They're actually adding nutrients that feed the plants and keep the ecosystem going. Destroying wetlands is an issue happening all over the world, including right here in Washington, which means everyone can work together to make a difference. Working with your conservation district um, in your county is an amazing way to make a difference because you can actually get plants from them and rehab the wetlands in your area to be better habitat for wild birds. With our help, these beautiful birds can make a comeback. Birds in general, I think are underappreciated and waterfowl especially. And what they bring is just a sense of joy and completeness to an ecosystem. Everybody loves an underdog and appreciating waterfowl is one of the best way to do that. Plus they're just beautiful. So far, we've touched tarantulas, seen snakes, and encountered snails that are extinct in the wild. Proving no matter how small and potentially alarming some of these creatures are, they play a vital role to our ecosystem. But we're not done just yet. Coming up, we go nocturnal. We'll use our ears instead of our eyes as we try to better understand bats in the wild. Vultures, uh, in general, are often thought to be dirty or disgusting birds, and that can't be farther from the truth. Sometimes it's going to be the smallest things that have, that have the biggest impact. What is necessary is just being able to understand how our lives are better for them being out there, and have a little bit of appreciation for, you know, for what they do for us. The parts of the tree snails are sort of a cautionary tale about when attempted biological control goes wrong. Halloween and bats go hand in hand, but these high-flying creatures deserve appreciation every day of the year. Now, we know bats play an important role in our ecosystem, but researchers are still learning a lot, both here in Washington and across the globe. Well, they're really unique animals. They're one of the largest fruit bats in the world. Their wingspan's almost five feet wide, and um, they are a true bat. They're fruit-eating bats, so most bats eat insects. These guys are fruit-eating bats, and so they spend most of their day sleeping in the trees and towards the end of the day when it starts to get um, dark at dusk they'll go out and look for fruit trees and orchards and they'll spend uh, most of the evening eating fruit and then they fly back to their roost tree. Bats play a really unique role in the environment. 
They're um, really good pollinators. Um, some bats eat insects, and they also are really good seed dispersers. So if you think about all these bats, thousands and thousands of bats flying around, eating fruit and dispersing seeds, they really help the environment. It's that they are found in really large flocks in the wild, and when they fly uh, in the evening, just as the sun is setting, they can often, you see large shadows of these bats flying across the sky. It's very impressive. They are actually doing well. Um, they're um, of least concern. They're not endangered. Um, but we do need to keep an eye on them because they, they are um, hunted um, because they do hit um, farms and orchards where there's a lot of fruits in their native habitat. That's going to do it for us today. I hope this experience has been worthwhile for you. It's important we focus on animals we may overlook or other times want to ignore. But the goal is that we show how valuable they are to our ecosystem. Coming up next week, we'll create living landscapes for people and wildlife. And we'll dive into an award-winning sustainability project here at Woodland Park Zoo. Plus, one man's trash is another man's treasure since we're gonna be doing a garden to grow our own food. In this craziness, we figured we'd start with the best compost in town. Get the scoop at the most popular compost facility in the Pacific Northwest. We'll show you how the zoo is turning animal poop into a hot commodity. Don't forget you can watch the entire Woodland Park Zoo docuseries on the Cairo 7 app. You can also head to our website, cairo7.com zoo for more. Thank you so much for joining us this week. I'm Shelby Miller, and I'll see you next time. Ah!